Hello, gang. Welcome back for another amazing episode with the Nailed It Ortho podcast. Uh, we have another great talk for you guys that I think you will really enjoy is on something that's, you know, kind of there's still a lot of literature being put out there. And uh, we got somebody here with us today that's kind of on the on the, the cutting edge of this stuff. He's always putting out literature on on these types of topics. But before we get too far, for those if it's your first time, let me introduce myself. I am Dr. Jay Fitz. I am one half of the the dream team here. My other partner here is uh, Dr. Cole. Uh, the other half of, of the dream team is present. There we go. And I'm actually going to kick it off to Dr. Cole so we can get this uh, get this show going. Yeah, for all my uh, my sports people out there, we have a a great talk today uh, in store for you guys about the posterior lateral corner injuries. Um, this is something I didn't know much of, you know, coming into residency, and then we spoke with Dr. Jorge Chala, um, who who did a great job of breaking this down. I mean, down to the millimeters, we we broke this down. Um, this is kind of a little bit more about um, Dr. Chala. Uh, he did his residency in of in orthopedic and traumatology over in Buenos Aires, Argentina, actually. Um, he did a couple of visiting fellowships, um, one at HSS and one at the Stedman uh, Research Institute. He also did a fellowship in regenerative sports medicine um, over at the Stedman uh, Institute. He also did a sports medicine fellowship at Cedar sinai slash the Kerlin Job Institute, and as well, another one at Rush. Now he's actually sports faculty over at Rush. And, you know, guys, this is a great talk. He uh, went into a lot of detail about posterior lateral corner injuries and we talked about physical examination, we talked about anatomy. Uh, we talked about, you know, how we how we fix these, um, kind of how to approach these types of injuries as a whole. So, you know, without further ado, enjoy the episode. You are now listening to Nailed It, the orthopedic surgery podcast featuring doctors Jay Fitz and Wendell Cole. Dr. Charlotte, thank you for coming on the podcast and uh, being a guest and coming and speaking and, and taking your time out to come and help educate the, the new future generation of orthopedic surgeons or the orthopedic surgeons that are already here that may just kind of want to brush up on their, their knowledge. So thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, guys. It's a real pleasure for me. Perfect. Awesome. So we'd love to kind of start off kind of just by asking some general questions, getting to know you a little bit better, seeing kind of about where you're from. And uh, my first question is actually, I uh, know we're kind of starting a little deep here, but you know, if, if you could give your 25 year old self advice, what would you say? Just push as hard as you can. And there are no real barriers in life. It's just a matter of keep pushing it and, and going around the walls and, and trying to just get a name and, and go for it. That'll be my, my main thing. You know, like sometimes people say you can't do this, you can't do that. I'm from Argentina. So coming here to the States, validating my degree here and, and, and trying to be in orthopedic surgery was quite a, quite a task. And everybody was like, well, you have to go back to residency. You can't just go straight to fellowship and, and nothing. It's just nobody can do it until somebody does it. So if you have your, clear aim and you want to go for it just push as hard as you can you'll find several walls and several people in the way saying that you can't do things but at the end of the day it's just you and your aim if you have a clear endpoint you'll just get to it man i love that especially the, the part where you said if if you're the um if nobody's done it you can be the first one to do it what, what part of argentina are you from i'm from the north of the country it's actually this the smallest province in the country it's called Tucuman. So I did med school there. Then I did uh, residency in Buenos Aires at the British Hospital. I did my PhD half there and half completed in the States. Then I went to uh, HSS in New York for a couple of months. Then I did two years and a half in Vail as a regenerative sports medicine fellow. Then one year in LA at Kerlin Job Institute. And then one year at Rush as a fellow and, and staying as an attending here at Rush. In Chicago. Okay, that's a that's a pretty, pretty neat trail of how you, how you got into orthopedics here. But I do have a question because actually me and uh, Wendell we actually did we spent some time in Colombia. Uh, we spent a couple of weeks out there and went and talked uh, English to some of the college kids out there and 
but in, and the whole time we was there, we were like, oh man, I really want to go to the hospital and see how orthopedic look, orthopedics look here. Um, and I was going to ask, how do you think, uh, I mean, how do you think the orthopedics, as far as comparing it to the U, the states here in, in Argentina, are there any major differences you think? So there's two systems in Argentina. It's a little bit different. There's a public system where everything is free. So 100% free. Let's say you go to Argentina and you have a fracture or, or whatever happens to you, you can get treatment for free. So everybody's going to treat you, put the nail, and you're going to receive zero bills from that. All right. The pr- the problem with that system is that it's slow and the all the things that they use are not probably the best, best quality ever, right? Mm. So that's the caveat to that. But there's a private system, which is much more expensive, of course. And in that system, it's probably more or less the same to what we use here. Now, the problem is that in Argentina, rarely people would do research, which is one of my main things in in my career right so if you really want to do research and and you want to pursue funding and and things like that that's really really hard to do in argentina and that's that's one of the main reasons why i i came here okay all right to get more on the research side i like it um that and okay just a side question real quick i have one more so if a lot of the the care is free uh how is the reimbursement for the physician how does that work so that's it's pretty simple they have a salary from the government which is usually not pretty high so whatever you do you get paid the same if you do 100 cases a month or two or three cases it's basically the same Mm. okay okay that's uh yeah i mean i kind of i like the system a little bit i I see it has some pros and cons for sure Exactly. So for the people that have less, it's probably a good system because they can get treatments for anything they want and it's free. It's not fast. It's not super efficient, but it's free. Right. So they don't have to worry about bills coming after you after. However, um, if you want to get a, a, a treatment in a timely fashion for surgeries that are elective, that's probably not the best system. Right. Does well, that make sense? That makes perfect sense. Absolutely. Okay. So I, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do, we'll do one more question before we get going. And, and this is something I know as an intern, I, I kind of think about it a lot. So I'm sure there's other people who's out there and uh, they're probably interested in sports, uh, sports medicine, but, and would like to know this as well. Is there any tips that you would give the young orthopedic surgeon on how to uh, improve or uh, work on his skills with the, the scope? Uh, as far as arthroscopic surgeries. So there are these new machines. I don't know if you've seen them. It's basically, they, they're like arthroscopy training machines or robots where you can do, I don't know, they have like stars inside the knee that you have to pick and then you can do partial meniscectomies, uh, meniscus repair, ACL reconstructions in the machine. And there, there has been a couple of good studies showing that when you do that, you really improve your skills. So when you get to the OR, you know what you're doing, you know how to triangulate, and you know how to grab the scope and, and things like that. And that that's an exponential thing because when you get, let's say, you go to your second year knowing how to do a simple scope, then the attendant is going to trust you more and give you more. By right. the end of a five-year residency, you're gonna, your skills are going to be so much better than the people that didn't train that it's something that it's almost an exponential growing of your skills. I like that. I- the other thing is that when when you go to a case and you know exactly what you have to do, right? If you, you let's say you go to a shoulder and you have to do a, a, a capsular release or something, if you know exactly why you're there, how you're going to do it, prepare for the case, ask the, the, your previous, like the resident, the older residents or, or the fellows, what is he going to do? How is he going to do it? Be prepared. Be one step ahead in the surgery. Those are things that are going to uh, give yourself the best chance to learn. And 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 the uh, attendance to give you more and more as the year goes by. Mm. Man, those are solid tips for anybody listening to this, especially if you're, you know, an intern uh, or even a med student or you know even a resident. Uh, those are some some solid tips that I, I might actually 
I might actually take some of those, that advice and, and invest in one or try to do something uh, when I can. So again, yeah, I think those are all great questions and great answers. And I think it's time we can tr- kind of transition here and um, get into the case for the day. You know, we're talking about posterior lateral corner injuries. So I think let's let's get let's go ahead and get back into it. So the case that we we wrote up today. So we wrote up uh, a case. We have a 24 year old football player comes into the clinic. Uh, he was playing football and had a twisting injury on the field. He felt his knee pop and states that he feels like his knee is giving out and also has pain on the lateral side of his knee. And this happened, let's say, three, four days ago. What are some of the things that you would kind of want to focus in on, on the history and the physical exam when you're kind of going through this? And keeping in mind that, of course, we're going to talk about posterior lateral corner injuries. Uh, but just general, what would you be looking at, on the lookout for? So first thing is that you have to understand what what is the mechanism of injury, right? If they have a varus uh injury or they had like a recurvatum injury, then you have to think that the postlateral corner might be involved. As you guys know, the most important thing to rule out here is if they have a neurovascular injury. If this patient comes three or four days after, most likely he's not going to have anything at that point because if if they had something pretty serious neurovascularly wise, then they will come before or sooner. Usually when, when they have a postlateral corner uh, tear or injury, they, have, they, they come pretty soon to clinic because, because it's usually a pretty massive injury. As you guys know, it, this is a pretty rare injury, but when it happens, it happens uh, with other ligamentous injuries as well, right? So mm-hmm. when you have a postlateral corner injury, it's really unlikely. So two out of 10 are going to be isolated, and eight out of 10 are going to be um, concurrent to other injuries like PCL injuries, ACL, or, or other injuries, or soft tissue injuries like meniscus injuries or cartilage injuries. So first thing first is understand the mechanism and, and suspect the injury. Second thing is to evaluate for all neurovascular injuries that, that might be present or not. The most common are popliteal artery, uh, common peroneal nerve injuries. And then uh, look for concomitant injuries at the same time. Okay. All right. And, and I had a question on, I guess, the mechanism of, of injuries. Um, Cause I, when I was reading on it and, you know, I was reading, you know, saying that, you know, you kind of spoke about having that various force. Um, and I was reading somewhere and it's saying like, if your ankle is in dorsiflexion versus plantar flexion, that you would have, you know, I guess kind of the majority of force would go through your patella versus a, versus, you know, a, a different part of the knee. Can you kind of explain um, that part of it is as far as mechanism of injury? So if you're in dorsiflexion, you're most likely to have a virus deformity. And, and therefore, um, it's not pretty usual in football lesions. The most common lesion when you're playing for football players is when they get tackled, right, from the right. inside, from the anteromedial aspect of the knee, and the knee right. goes into weaker vitamin and virus. So when you go to varus, then all the postlateral corner um, structures get stretched out. They usually don't tear. It's, you really rarely see an avulsion or a tear like you would see with the ACL. They just stretch out. Does that make sense? So right. you want, when you're doing the surgery and you're looking for these structures, it's not as common that you will see the FCL or, or the public is completely avulsed. They just, they're just there. But when you when you test them, they're not functionally working. If that makes sense, right? Okay, and that was actually a, a nice lead in. I was going because we have to know that you are all over the anatomy of the knee. Uh, so we were going to ask, can you kind of well, for one, just kind of mention why is this even important in the first place? Why does it matter about this your PLC uh, being injured, and also? Uh, can you explain the important anatomy of this of this area as well? Yes, yeah, so it, it's really important because the biomechanics of the knee rely quite a bit on, on the postlateral corner. The postlateral corner was once known as the dark side of the knee because nobody knew very well was if if which were the structures, what was the purpose, the biomechanics of the postlateral corner of the knee. My mentor, Dr. Laprade basically did his pyramid approach where he basically studied the anatomy, 
then the biomechanics developed an anatomic reconstruction, then tested that reconstruction. The, the postnatural corner is composed about, uh, with uh, primary stabilizers, which are the, the lateral collateral ligament, the popliteus and the popliteus fibular ligament, and secondary structures, which are the iliotibial band, the arcuate fibers, uh, the, the popliteal muscle, and, and all the muscles that surround the knee on the lateral side. But the three main structures are the LCL, the PFL, popliteus fibular, and the popliteus tendon. The LCL is the main restraint to varus, and the popliteus is the main restraint to rotation. So when these two are injured, you're going to have significant rotational instability. And this is important because if you don't recognize this in the beginning, and you let's say you reconstruct the ACL or the PCL alone, those graphs are going to have significantly higher strain if you don't reconstruct the lateral side. Does that make sense? So before, they used to reconstruct the cruciates only because they, they didn't identify the postlateral coronary injury, and those people will fail at an extremely higher rate than other people that has just an isolated ACL or PCL. So it's really, really important to identify these injuries when you suspect they could be there. Right. Yeah, I, I was reading on that, and it was pretty much saying exactly what you just said. So and I think I was reading among the time, among some of the literature was saying that many of the failed ACL reconstructions, some of them can be due to the fact that it was a concomitant posterior lateral corner injury that went, um, went unnoticed or went undiagnosed as well. That's correct. That's 100% correct. And the problem with this is that sometimes it's really hard to diagnose because when you examine a patient with a postural corner injury, they usually have a mat, like a, a, a knee with a lot of edema, right? A lot of effusion. So it's sometimes hard to determine if you, if you have a virus stress test that is positive or not. And this is where stress x-rays probably have the main role and also in the chronic setting because you can actually have an objective measurement of how much this knee is opening or gapping in virus in comparison to the other knee. Right. Now, before we moved on, because that, that would have been a perfect segue to, to imaging, I, I still had, a, I had another question about the anatomy. So, because when I was reading on reading about it, they organized the anatomy into like three different layers. Now, is it a good way to approach it, thinking of it as, you know, these are the different layers, you know, this is from superficial to deep, or should we kind of just think of the main structure that you just spoke about, you know, the LCL, the, the PFL, in popliteus, so or how, how do you kind of approach this? So the layers, it's a didactic way of trying to understand how the anatomy is layered, right? If you think about it in a biomechanical way, then thinking about the structures, the primary structure is the way to go. Now, if you're thinking into a surgical way, a layered way is pretty good because you can understand how you go from, from most superficial to the deepest aspect of it, right? If you think about it that way, the first layer is the skin and the subcutaneous tissue. After you, you pass that, that, that would be layer zero, let's say, for what, what the book says. Then layer one would be the IT band. We just redefined the, the anatomy of the IT band. We just published our article in the American Journal for Sports Medicine where we found that the IT band is one of the main structures of the anterolateral knee. And it's really important to control rotation as well. So Kaplan in 1958 described what he called the Kaplan fibers, which is a, a an attachment of a, of the a fibers of the IT band into the proximal into the distal femur. That when you section those fibers, you can see that you have an increased internal rotation of, of the knee joint. So it's important to recognize that that is one of the main things that you, you need to recognize and not injure when you're doing your approach to the lateral knee. Once you take the IT band down, then you can see mainly three structures. The first one, the most interior structure is the, the popliteus tendon, which lies in the, into the popliteal sulcus, which is almost touching the cartilage. It's the only tendon that is intra-articular in the body, in, in the knee, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Then 18 millimeters posterior to that, you have the LCL, which is posterior to the lateral epicondyle. 4.5 millimeters posterior and proximal to that, you have the, the ALL. And this ligament has been uh, pretty famous lately because it has been on the news for a while with some people saying that 
this was a ligament that was never described before and was just described in 2013 by Klaas, a, a, Bel uh, a surgeon from Belgium. But uh, these are all structures that control to, the, to help control the rotation of the knee. We usually try to think of this in a very simplistic way, where we say the ACL is the only one that, that avoids anterior translation of the tibia. And it's not. It's one of the main, one of the multiple structures that control that. Same thing happens in the lateral knee. Rotation is controlled by the AT band, by the anterolateral ligament, by the popliteus. So there are by the meniscus as well. So there are multiple structures that work uh, synergistically to avoid excessive rotation, excessive translation, excessive virus gapping or virus gapping. Awesome. I think that's. Uh... I mean that was an excellent background just on the on the pure anatomy so that someone can get a a pretty good understanding of what what we're talking about here um helped me out a whole lot helped me understand a few things that I was kind of questioning so that was great um I was going to get back to our 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 football player here our from our case uh so like you said I know you you mentioned that it's difficult to diagnose this type of injury sometimes so uh what are we looking for on physical exam and what are some of the tests that we might do to uh, diagnose this type of injury? So the first thing we need to do is probably examine the patient very well. So look at the, look at the leg, see how much effusion they have. If they can walk, see if they can walk. If it's a chronic injury, they may have a virus thrust. So you can see that the knee gaps in, in virus when they're walking. So that's the first thing we need to do. If they cannot walk, you just examine the patient in um, standing position first because if they have a virus alignment, that's a huge risk factor for re-tear of the, of the PLC, right? So if they have a chronic injury, you might need to do a long limb alignment actually before because you might have to do a high tibial osteotomy to correct the deformity be before you do a post lateral corner reconstruction. There are some studies saying that if you just correct the alignment of that person without reconstructing the post lateral corner in the chronic setting, 42% of those people do not need a post lateral reconstruction after. So that's really important to, to see. Okay. Then in the acute setting, it's really important that you do a virus test. That's the most common. Um, some things that you have to take into consideration is that if the knee gaps at 30 degrees, that means that the primary structure, so the LCL is torn. However, if the knee gaps in extension, every time that the knee gaps in extension, even for virus or vigus, that means that there's something wrong, that it's, there is something that is uh, most likely going, going to be surgical because that, that means that it's pretty severe, that the capsule and the whole postural corner is blown. For less severe injuries, the, the, um, the sternal rotation and recurvatum test, which is basically grabbing the foot by by the foot and just lifting it up and seeing comparatively to the other knee how much it goes up or how much hyperextension they have, that can give you a hint that something is going on if you have more than 2.5 centimeters in the in the injured side. Does that make sense? That we've we've published that on our proscopy and we've shown that you have 89% sensitivity if you have more than 2.5 centimeters of difference to the contralateral side for an ACL FCL combined injury. Also, you can do a dial test, but the dial test is not very sensitive, to be honest, because you're looking at it from the back and sometimes rotation in the hip can fool you on how much rotation you have at the knee point. And then if it's pretty severe, you can do any test and, and, and that should be pretty good, like a post lateral drawer, but those are usually pretty hard to do in the acute setting because the patient is usually guarding. Right, and, and how would you perform those physical exam um, tests? So I explained already the recurvatum test. Then for the post lateral drawer is basically the same as a posterior drawer, putting some pressure on the tibial tubercle backwards, but also rotational in external rotation. So that, that one is uh, one that is pretty impressive when you can do it, mostly in the chronic setting because you can really see how the knee rotates more. Then for the dial test, you have to have the, the patient lying prone and then you bring the knees to 30 degrees of flexion, and then you externally rotate both foot, both feet. And then when you rotate, you can see how much they rotate comparatively. If it, the rotation is more on, on the suspected post-lateral corner side, 
then you can assume that the postlateral corners are injured. Then after you do that, then you bring it to 90 degrees and then you basically do the same. Now, if it's at, so I remember I was reading, so if it's positive at 30 degrees, it, it's just like a posterior lateral corner injury versus at 90, it's, it's a combined uh, PLC and or PCL injury. Is that, is that correct? That's correct. So if you have at 90, if you have a, a higher degrees of rotation at 90 degrees, you have to suspect that it's not only the postlateral corner, but also at least the PM bundle of the PLC, which provides rotation, external rotation to the knee as well. Oh, okay, okay. I, 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 uh, I never equated it being that posterior uh, medial bundle of the PCL. That's, um, that's great. I, I appreciate you saying that. So are there, before we move on to like any imaging, is there anything else kind of on the physical exam or any other, um, anything else that you'd want to cover or, or, or want to do in this patient? I think those are the main tests. If you have, if you suspect anything on this patient's in the acute setting of a neurovascular injury, you should do an ABI, which is an uh, ankle, ankle brachial index, meaning that you have to measure the, the pressure in the arm and in, in the lower limb. If the pressure is, is, is this ABI index is less than 0 0.9, meaning that the pressure on the lower limb is lower by 0 0.9, what, what, what you're measuring on the arm, then you have to do something more complex, a CT angiogram or something like that to be able to detect if there is any vascular injury. Right. This is also yep. important if you have a revision setting because you don't know where the vessels are. And therefore, this is something that, that you have to do in a routine basis for revision in the revision settings if they have a re-injury of the postural corner reconstruction. Okay. Yeah, I think that was really helpful as well. I know with a lot of the uh, joints, there's so many tests that you can read about and hear about. And it's, it's, it's kind of for a young orthopedic doctor, it's tough to know which ones are more clinically relevant uh, and has, you know, sometimes they have the, the higher sensitivity and specificity. So that was really helpful. Um, I think that was a, a, a huge help for a lot of people there. Um, so I think with, for us, this is, when, when we think about physical examination, it's so subjective, right? Like you need a lot of experience. I don't know if a lot, but, but you need quite a bit of experience to be able to determine like, this is a positive Lachman, right? This, this guy has an ACL. The first time you see it and you do the Lachman and you, there's an, an ACL injury, it's really hard to say for sure, like for sure this is an ACL injury, right? It's the same thing like with a stethoscope. When, when they say, I don't know, can you listen to the heart? Do you, you feel the, can you hear the R3 or the R4? Sometimes you say like, yes, but you're truly not yeah. uh, understanding what you're little, listening, right? I remember so, those days. <laughs> yeah. I still remember them because I still can hear them. <laughs> <laughs> For this kind of injuries, having stress x-rays where you can actually measure millimeters and you have actually a guideline that be like basically tells you what it is, it's pretty helpful for the guys that are starting. And this was developed mainly by Dr. Laprade, where he basically took uh, specimens, cadavers, and he just sectioned the FCL and measured how much it would open. Then the section the whole post structural corner and measure on the stress x-rays how much it would open. So if it opens up more than 2.7 millimeters in comparison to the contralateral side, you can expect that that guy has a, an FCL injury. But if it gaps more than four millimeters in, the, in comparison to the contralateral side, that patient might have uh, more, than a, more than an FCL and it could be a postural corner injury. So that's one of the main studies that is pretty inexpensive and it's pretty objective. And it's really important for the people that it's starting because that's an objective, objective way of measuring how much um, virus deformity you have at that time point and to be able to understand what you're dealing with. And, and just to just to reiterate, you said if it gets more than two point seven centimeters, you're thinking millimeters. Millimeters, you're thinking uh, you're thinking PLC. I, isolated FCL or oh, lateral, I mean FCL. lateral ligament. And, and if then, you have more than four, that that's when you have to start thinking about a combined post structural corner injury. 
Uh, awesome. Okay. Okay. So yeah, that actually just um, that just actually kind of went into the next two things we wanted to talk about. Um, I was gonna say. So you talked about imaging, and you also talked about uh, measuring the amount of translation or displacement. Um, so along so with this, that, is it's actually the, the amount of gapping. Yeah, okay. side. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, so, other than I know you was, we were talking about some of the stress views. Uh, what 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 are all the images that we should look into? Uh, look into ordering or trying to get to kind of get a better picture of these type of in, these types of injuries. So the first ones that we need to take are the three views, right? AP lateral sunrise view, just to make sure that there's no uh, dislocations or fractures at this point. The second thing is that, as we said before, if you have a chronic case, you really, really need to ask for a long limb x-ray. Because if you have a patient which is in Paris, then you have to correct that at the time of the post coronary surgery or before. Um, once you've done that, then the second thing is virus stress x-rays. Because those are the that that x-ray is the one that can give you the most information sometimes even more than the MRI. Mm. Okay. So stress, stress actually are really important. Once you have that, it is also important to get an MRI. Why? Because you, first, first of all, you can see if there's a lot of edema there. It's, it's really hard to see a tear like you see in the ACL on the post lateral corner. But if you have a lot of edema and the bone bruising, which is characteristic of a post lateral corner, then you have to think about it. But most of all, you need to look at the capsule and the biceps insertion. Why? Because if you have a biceps insertion which is off, meaning that the biceps is evolved from the fibula, then when you do your dissection, the first thing you need to find is the common perineal nerve. When the biceps is evolved, you can find it anywhere. So you have to go really slow because that nerve can be anywhere. It is really okay. dangerous to make the dissection of a postlateral corner when the biceps tendon is evolved from the fibula. Mm. And also, you, you have to know that if you have the capsule, which is a vault, then you have to fix it with anchors. So that can change your operative pr protocol or plan, right, moving forward. Okay. Absolutely. So that, that I can see that being a, a huge key. Uh, and say with the stress, the, the stress views, um, are you also getting those in the, for in the acute setting? Uh, where yes. The, where the is kind of guarding and everything like that. Okay. Yes. And they're pretty easy, easy to, to take. You just have to be with the patient, explain it to him, saying this is going to take just one second. It's going to give us probably the most important piece of information. So I really need you to help me out here. Right? So you put him in 20 degrees of flexion for the x-ray. You go yourself. You do a good varus for two seconds. Take the x-ray. Make sure that it's not rotated measure the gapping, and then you, you, you can compare it to the contralateral side. Mm. Nice. I like it. Mm. Okay. Uh, let's see. So, all right, we just went through the radiographs. We went through some good tests there. Are, are there any, before we get into treatment, are there any uh, grading systems of these injuries that, that is clinically relevant to you? So we just had our postlateral corner expert consensus statement. It has been published in KSSTA. And I led that project. And basically, one of the main things that everybody agreed on, we had 32 surgeons from all over the world that do more than 50 postlateral corner reconstructions a year. And they all agree that there is no good classifications. Most of, most of them are descriptive, meaning they say you have this or that injured. But... A good classification is a classification that gives you a prognosis, meaning that a classification that can tell you what to do, right? If you have a grade one, you can do this. If you have a grade two, you can do that. The, the AMA classification, which is the grade one, zero to five, five to 10 or more than 10, doesn't give you much prognosis and doesn't give you any type of protocol to follow. So that's why the classification that I like is the stress x-ray. Mm. Because if you have just an FCL injury, which is isolated, that's the one that you might be able to treat conservatively. Whereas if you have more than four millimeters difference between both sides, 
that's the one you need to, need to treat surgically. Okay. But, wow. but there are no good classifications so far. I like it. I, I like I like the classification which you just had. I think that's really great and, and can really be useful. Now, say we have this patient um, and, you know, we suspect this injury. What are the non-operative versus operative indications? Like how would you treat patients with a, a PLC injury? So, again, that starts when you're uh, looking at the patient and examining the patient. If a patient gaps in extension, meaning you do a virus stress test, and that patient gaps in extension, that's a surgical patient 100% of the times. If that patient has a combined injury, meaning a full structural corner plus PCL plus ACL, that's a surgical patient. And why? When you see the natural history studies, and you look at, at the dogs and, and, and all the animal studies, the medial side and the lateral side are completely different. The medial side of the knee has a convex, convex structure, which is the condyle, articulated with a concave structure, which is the, the tibial plateau. On the lateral side, it's an inherently unstable structure because you have a condyle on the lateral side, and the lateral tibial plateau is also convex. So if you don't have the, the soft tissue structures to hold it in place, then it's going to fail most of the times. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. It makes perfect sense. So if you have a, an injury that it's not complete or it gaps only at 30 degrees, that injury you can try and it's isolated, that's the one injury that you can go ahead and, and try to rehab it. Okay. Whereas if you have a, a, a complete tear of the post corner or if it's associated with with other injuries, then that's the one you want to treat with surgery. And the second thing is when you have a chronic injury that is symptomatic, meaning that they have a virus thrust, they feel that it's unstable, so that's the one that you, you'll need to reconstruct at some point. Now, now for the acute patients, let's say they have a you know a concomitant um, other ligamentous injury, uh, ACL or PCL. Do you do you reconstruct at the exact same time? Like, do you do you do all the surgery at the same time, or you stage it, or kind of how did, how would how would you do that? So that's a very controversial topic, and for what the for for the reasons that I explained before, if you do not reconstruct the whole thing at the, at the same time, the strain in the grafts are going to be much higher, and the chances of failing that you have on, on your index reconstructions are going to be higher. Right. Meaning that if you do just the ACL and you don't reconstruct the postural corner, the chances of that ACL failing are going to be higher. Now, some people say that if you reconstruct the whole thing, you have higher chances of having postoperative stiffness. But if you move those people from time zero, if you do an anatomic reconstruction and you can move it in the R, that means that you can move it afterwards as well. So you have to start with range of motion from day zero, mm -hmm. from day one, right after they they get out of the wire, you have to send them to PT and just make sure that they don't get stiff. They have to be moving zero to 90 in the first two weeks for sure. Now, now, do you use allografts or anything or like, how do you, do you typically like repair versus reconstruction versus allograft? How do you typically um, uh, proceed? Like, or, or what are the indications for when you use one versus the other? That's a good question. So, Gene Stannard from uh, Missouri showed that when you reconstruct, you have a 4% failure rate. When you repair the lateral side, you have a 20% failure rate. This is significant, statistically significant. So um, multiple studies in the literature have shown now that repairing the lateral side of structures is not a very good option. So the reconstruction is a way to go. Now, when you think about all the reconstruction options, trying to reconstruct the anatomy so anatomic-based reconstructions are probably the best. When you reconstruct this, it depends on where you live also, because here in the States we have a lot of allografts, but in Argentina, for example, you don't. So if you don't have allografts, you have to do it with autographs. If you're here, I think allografts have shown to be pretty reliable and also much more efficient if you have to do a multi-ligament reconstruction, because if you have to start taking uh, graphs from the patient that's at a time to the surgical time which is already long right right and also if you if you have to take the hamstrings you further destabilize the knee so you want to take as less as you can from the patient and try to reconstruct everything as efficient 
and as time as less time consuming as possible. Mm, okay. A question that I that I, that I have uh, I often have with a lot of different pathologies because early on in, in our careers we we tend to uh, treat these patients acutely and what we don't really kind of see what happens with them we don't get to see uh, you know the follow up visit so once 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 they, you know you you've done this surgery they're in rehab now hopefully and they're doing well with that they come to your clinic it's two weeks out is a month out is three months out. What are we looking for as far as comp- complications and what are some of the things that you're looking to make it uh, just kind of assure yourself that they're progressing well? So the main thing, as we spoke before, is stiffness, right? If you don't get a, a, a protocol that is pretty strict and you get them to PT and you get the, the CPM so they can move it from time zero, then those patients are going to get stiff. That's the main complication. It's not... And it's devastating for most of the patients because if you if you cannot flex your knee all the way down, that's fine. But if you cannot extend it, that's a huge problem for the patients because they can't walk normally. So the, the their gait mechanic is off, and that is something that throws patients off. And you have to go back and do a lysis of adhesions. And none of the surgeries that you do subsequently after the, the index surgery are as good as the first one. So you try to make sure that the first one goes right. You have to make sure that the, that patient rehabs in the right manner, be on top of the patient, try to, if they can go to therapy every single day, you have to make sure that they are exercising at home with a pretty solid uh, home-based exercise. Right. Then when you're, when you're reconstructing these injuries, you have intraoperative risks, which are high in this surgery because you have all the neurovascular bundle right there. When you do your tibial tunnel, the public tibial artery is right there. If you don't do a good dissection of the nerve, if it's not injured from from the injury itself, then you can damage the nerve as well. So there are a lot of inherent risks from the surgery itself, besides all the the, the risks of any surgery, like blood clots and and anesthesia problems and and infections, right? Yeah. But the main things that are inherent to this pathology are neurovascular injury during the surgery and then stiffness after the surgery. Man, I, I love it. I, I really, I think that was a great, great talk. I think you did a great job uh, and, and touched all the high points of everything we kind of um, uh, wanted to touch on as far as uh, posterior lateral corner injuries. Uh, before, we wrap, before we wrap up here in a second, do you, is there, are there any parting words that you would like to uh, give to the listeners, you know, it might be the young orthopedic guy who's trying to decide whether he wants to do sports or anything about posterior lateral corner injuries or anything that you want to say to the people. Yeah, so I think this is a fascinating field in sports medicine because not a lot of people um, does them. And, and a lot of surgeons are pretty pretty afraid of these injuries because as this is probably 1% or 2% of their practices. This is not something that that comes across everybody, and when they have it, they just want to send it to somebody else, you know? Right. I, I was fortunate enough to train with, with a guy that does probably four or five of these a week, which is so the Pride in Vail. So, so this, this is probably one of my main passions, and I think if you, if you try to understand the anatomy, the, the biomechanics, if you go to the lab and dissect these structures, then – it really becomes a passion because you you understand that you can really treat these injuries and and also make them better and make them go back to a high level of, of activity. So yeah, I think it's really important for everybody, especially going to sports medicine, to, to understand this topic and, and to be able to understand that we can actually do a good job at, at getting these people back to what they want to do. Dr. Shala, I think, I think you did a great talk. Um, I really enjoyed it, really learned a lot. Now, for the people listening that want to reach out to you that or that want to follow you, um, is there you know any any social media or any any way that these people can reach out to you? Yeah, I have a, a social media that my wife manages. <laughs> so far, my Instagram is uh, Chicago Sports Doc, and my Facebook is Jorge Chala, and my website should be coming out soon. So, if if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me. My my email is. Jorge, J-O-R-G-E, dot Chala, C-H-A-H-L-A, at rushortho.com. 
Man, again, thank you so much for, for coming out to the podcast. Really enjoyed speaking to you. Thank you, guys. This was a, a great podcast, and I really enjoyed the questions, and I hope it helps. Thank you all for listening to yet another episode of the Nailed It Ortho podcast. We hope you enjoyed this talk on posterior lateral corner injuries. Dr. Chaw gave a great, great overview. It went in depth. I've listened to this a couple of times. I hope you guys learn something. Now, if you haven't already, please go and follow us um, at Nailed It Ortho on Instagram as well as NailedItOrtho.com. You can go to the show notes there. Just look under posterior lateral corner injuries. That's where you can find everything about that we kind of discussed in this episode. And if you haven't, subscribe to the podcast so you can get updated every time something comes out. All right. Well, you have a great day.